public to come to more artists now lecture series, including uh, next week. So let me uh, let you know about next week, October 12th. Uh, Tom Lawson, known for his quirky, unusual approach, Lawson will speak about the sources, inspirations, and ideas behind his functional and dysfunctional object designs, including furniture, ropes, and sculpture. Should be nice. Should be nice to mix up to a uh, different medium, a different week. So please uh, try to attend next week if you could. I know my students; they have to be here. So we, we will go. Through, we will see all this and enjoy it. And again, a huge part of this artist now lecture is, is our discussions, the questions you bring to the table, and it's always up to the artist if he or she wants to take questions during the talk or after. But let's have a lively discussion. And talk about the work, but uh, I'm going to hand the mic over to Polly Martin, who will introduce tonight's guest. Let me see if I can do this without um, making horrible feedback. I'm Polly Morris. I'm the executive director of the Linden Sculpture Garden, and I also administer the Greater Milwaukee Foundation's Mary L. Noll Fund Fellowships for Individual Artists Program. Uh, and it's in that capacity that I'm here tonight to introduce Paul Luca, who's sitting behind me. Paul is one of the seven 2010 fellows. Um, there, the, the exhibition of the work by the 2010 fellows is currently down at Nineveh on Prospect. I uh, strongly urge you to go see the show if you haven't seen it, or go see it again if you have seen it. I put postcards over here on this table. On the back of the postcard, it lists all the ancillary events that go with the exhibition of which this is the first. So each of the fellows is doing at least one event, either a screening or a performance or, or a gallery talk. And I suggest you get your hands on one of these and check it out. Um, there's also a very lovely catalog that goes with the exhibition that you can peruse down at Innova, or if you're feeling flushy, you can buy one. Um, there are essays on all the seven artists, and uh, before I read Paul's um, introductory bio, which I hope I can see in the dark, um, I'd like to remind those of you who are not students and are applying for the 2011 Noel Fellowship, the deadline is tomorrow. Tomorrow, tomorrow. So if you haven't gotten it in, rush home and do that, please. Thanks. Um, for his projects, Paul Druga has solicited strangers door to door, christened the park courtyard, rolled out the red carpet. I think you just saw some of that. Uh, been a benefactor, initiated a board of directors, and memorialized the act of memorialization. He has worked with venues including the Kölnische Kunstverein in Germany, many mini residency in Berlin, the suburban Chicago, the outpost for contemporary art in Los Angeles, Green Gallery here in Milwaukee, and the Contemporary Arts Museum Houston. Druka's work has been featured in Camera Austria, an interview, and written about in Art Forum, Art in America, Artnet.com, and Metropolis.com. His essay, Lines on Abbey Bridge, was recently published by Kent State University. <coughs> and with that, I will turn it over to Paul. start with this, uh, you know, and I, I want to just give it a little bit of a You know, cameras and people. It's, you know, it's going to be a theme that 
kind of comes up again and again as I go through the work. Um, the, there, that said, there are a lot of different mediums, uh, a lot of different approaches that I bring to this to very, very different projects. And here is it. Actually, another iteration of this project uh, a year later in Cologne. And so I'm going to come back to talk about the brightest star shine, but briefly, um, if it's not obvious, the, you know, the idea was to roll out the red carpet uh, for this event, but for everybody that was attending, had to cross this threshold, and we'll read by the paparazzi. There's a couple images of work that's not uh, mine. This is, uh, you probably know, uh, the work of Bernd and Hilla Becker. Uh, there's a famous 
famous German photographic couple um, making these very, very iconic, amazing images um, about very pedestrian phenomena. I'm sorry. this word is for me comes, you know, much later. So chronologically, it's maybe a, a, a little out of place, but I mean, you'll see the relevance. And, you know, there's one thing for sure is like this, this pedestrian aesthetic. Um, and another thing is the, like the nature of the grid and the seriality that they're using. Um, for me, it, it kind of evokes like Obviously, there's a starting point and there's an end point. Um, and it frames that very, very correctly and very nicely. But at the same time, that notion of, of seriality to me also um, alludes to this, like that it continues. Like there's these nine water towers, but of course then there's nine more that are kind of the same, yet kind of different. And this question of like what, what can be special um, like all of this uh, just kind of feeds back into my work. Um, and their, the Becker's work is, is amazing. So they, I mean, I don't even know all the things that they did, but water towers is huge and blast furnaces and uh, um, uh, certain facades, all of which have this similarity and yet distinction. Um, this is a social event archive uh, it started in 1997, went to 2007. Again, this interest in uh, the photograph and its relationship to uh, the individual. Um, you know, this is, this is long before digital photography, back when it was all material, 35 millimeter, um, take it to the drugstore and pick it up in an hour. And, you know, still people are amassing all of these images. And the question that I was curious about at the time is like, you know, what are the meanings? Is, is any of it special? Can it possibly be special when there's so much of it? Um, and so what I decided to do was create an archive with some simple guidelines that anybody could contribute one photograph from their personal collection to this archive. They would, I would not curate the images, um, but they would be archived in the order received and then presented back to the public. In, exhibitions like this, uh, always with the invitation for other people to contribute images. So that's the clear flexi deposit box. Um, it's just a slightly tighter shot to kind of establish this relationship of audience. And, you know, these images, uh, obviously, again, not about the art of photography, but about something very existential. Um, and, uh, you know, I, the question of, of is it possible um, to kind of feel special as, as one of many, many, many human beings? We're all kind of doing the same thing. Um, and the, like the relationship of the photos, so it's, you know, they, they're related to one another, they're archived, they, they have this chance relationship. Um, and what never resolved for me, how the project kind of kept its interest over all those years, was, was that that question of is it possible to be special or not doesn't resolve, um, but kind of keeps, uh, what, you know, keeps like agitating this relationship between the images. Um, part of the, also, something that becomes important to me has been and be, it, I'm just becoming more aware of is um, like what is the context of the work and how does it validate itself? Um, and certainly this kind of plays back into my whole, you know, like how does the individual function in relationship to this larger social dynamic and the institutions that, you know, are comprised by that. Um, so the archive in a way validates itself and you know, my job was just to figure out ways to get it back into the public. One was to 
to produce these books um, that then were distributed, uh, largely self-financed and self-published. Um, the, the volume three and four had essays that were included. Volume three is a nice essay by David Robbins, which was uh, then reprinted in Camera Austria. Um, and of any of the projects, I guess the Social Event Archive has gotten like the most kind of critical attention and writing on it. And thankfully, by whatever, the mid 2000s, certainly by 2007, I didn't foresee the end point of the project, but like digital photography took over and people's relationship to images changed, everything is on the internet, and the project was happily concluded. The, um, I guess an intro to this, the blue dress part, which is now from 2000, is, is just an acknowledgement of um, Alan Capro and the happenings. And then that, I guess here's like a sense of like what can be the material for art. Um, and, you know, him just obviously what making it clear that that this social dynamic can be an end of itself. And so I fell in love with this very odd, awkward slab of cement on the northwest end of the Holt Street Bridge in Milwaukee um, that's not used for anything and is not, you know, very usable. Um, it's just kind of extra space. And, and really, really, I was kind of obsessed and liked, I guess, what what it represents to me is just sheer potential. Um, you know, it's not used for anything, and so then it, I guess, could be used for anything and everything. Um, and wanted to do something there, uh, and thought about it for a, a long time, and realized that you know, any obvious putting something there was going to transform the space and um, make me not like it for for the reasons that I was so attached to it. So I finally decided to christen it, I don't know, this act that I kind of take very seriously, again, in like, like how far can the individual assert themselves within <clears throat> this other power structure of the city, um, and invited a bunch of people, so, so for a, a christening celebration. This is the cover of the invitation. Um, it was fourfold. And you open it up once, you got an information, and then you open it up another time, and you got this very fantastical view uh, of the car. And uh, just a couple, you know, shots from the twisting celebration. Tons of people came out. And I guess for me, the, the uh, what was important was to kind of activate that space and then it goes back to becoming exactly what um, it was before. And I actually revisit the project uh, in 2010, and am happy to say, like, the city it has changed. Everything around that space has changed. All these condos have gone in, and, you know, the Brewer's Hill has become this uh, very upscale neighborhood. But Blue Dress Park is exactly the same now, today, um, as it was when I first fell in love with it. Um, you know, they, so in this invitation, for me, the, uh, what, the point that I want to make is, um, it's in between this, this notion of, like I don't ask permission, of course there would be official channels and people that you could approach, to, you know, to kind of get I, you know, the powers that be on board. <clears throat> and I totally ignored that. But it's, on the other hand, it's not guerrilla because after getting everything set up, I then invite those people, like I invited the mayor and I invited the head of the parks department. And I, you know, like all these people that would be in the process of officially sanctioning such an act. <clears throat> so, you know, it's not guerrilla on the other hand. It's not trying to go under the radar. Um, and like that kind of in-betweenness, I guess, is, is somehow, it's important for me, for 
perhaps in this question or attempt to locate myself in these larger structures. Um, and so from, from, you know, the, like this very what, public uh, kind of action, we go like to the exact extreme opposite uh, with a project called Between Sleep and Awake. Um, and this is an installation view from the Contemporary Art Museum in Houston, but for this project, it's, this is like, it takes place, the, the field work for this is maybe like 2003 to the beginning of 2004. Um, but I'm setting up my camera at the bedside of various people with a cable release. Um, again, this is still 35 millimeter, and, and asking them to snap the cable release the very, very first moment of and I mean, so like going back even to the social event archive, of course, there's also this interest um, with, with like diffusing authorship and seeing like at what points within a project authorship can kind of come in. I mean, it's my project and I'm orchestrating these images and setting up all the parameters, but of course I'm not controlling the image that's resulting. Um, from that, and I mean, it's a very, very unwieldy process with lighting conditions and, and composition, and, and just the nature of how someone would interpret the very first thing upon waking. Like all of that is, you know, intentional. Um, this is uh, another install uh, shot from uh, sadly now defunct gallery in Milwaukee, KM Art. Again, this idea of, of like kind of taking control of the distribution of the project and self-producing this little book, like this is, I mean, I think that like the best realization of the project is maybe like eight by 14 or something. It's like a really lovely kind of intimate relationship with these photographs um, that, you know, that they, they're like printed on map paper and like you could see in the, in the exhibitions, like they're not framed, so they, they remain very kind of accessible and raw. Um, they're, you know, like there's, they're, they become noisy, like the composition, it, like it's, it's kind of about this other moment. Um, and, you know, kind of sharing authorship. And the one other point uh, that becomes kind of clear is like my interest in how in how lists come together or how groups aggregate. Uh, so if I'm going to ask, I think it was like 25 people for this project, like who is who is that going to be? Um, and that becomes a very, I don't know, idiot, well, I mean a very idiosyncratic process for me, or one that like continues to kind of hold interest in, in how I approach it. Um, and it's not, uh, I call attention to it, and it's not something that I can explain. I mean, it, like, it's still something that I feel is, is very quirky and interesting, and it will also come up in other projects in different ways. But it's not about, for this, and you know, for such a kind of uh, intimate uh, ask, um, it, it was not about approaching the obvious. I mean, certainly there are some friends who would be like, yes, you can set up your camera at my bed. And that's kind of you know odd or weird, but then there was like people that would be like at the at the border of what would that what would be socially <coughs> appropriate or acceptable, and then some people that would be just beyond that border a little bit. Um, so you know, I said I invited the mayor to Blue Dress Park, and he did not show up. But he sent me like a nice letter saying he was sorry that his people sent me a letter saying he was sorry. That um, and then I was thinking I wanted to get, you know, ask him to uh, participate in this. And I couldn't even get the invitation to the mayor, but this is one of his key liaisons who I had no kind of relationship with at all who generously agreed to um, participate in the project. I guess just as one kind of example of, of what my interest was in, in kind of getting this group. Uh, I was in Houston for a couple of years, um, which was fascinating for you know someone who's curious.
curious about how a city functions and the social dynamics is, is so, so very different um, than, than, well, than Milwaukee. And, you know, I think any place they compare it to LA, but it's, you know, it's in Texas. It, like, still has a little bit of that weird Wild West, though it's a very liberal city in a lot of ways. Um, the, and, some of these. I decided to, uh, to give the city of Houston a gift of art. Um, I had been trying to like just have a conversation. They actually, they actually, I mean, they had more money and they had like somebody in government who kind of oversaw all of their public art. Um, and I was just trying to have a conversation with this person because I was interested in public art and you know, what that, how that functioned, like, like both the aesthetic purposes of public art but also the civic purposes a public, what this person would have nothing to do with me, like would not even acknowledge <clears throat> um, my presence. And so, you know, after a time of being in that, being in Houston, I decide that I'm going to give the city of Houston a piece of art. So I commissioned a sculpture from Chicago artist Scott Wolniak, who was doing the, um, you know, like fashioning these lovely weeds from trash that he would find. And, you know, I pay him a bunch of money, really, so I could just install it in this kind of uh, underused urban green space in downtown Houston, and then, you know, kind of use, use again this tactic of, like, having this ceremony, like an unveiling ceremony with uh, three, you know, influential civic leaders came and spoke, I ask nobody's permission. Um, of course, the city doesn't want people giving it anything that it hasn't already okayed. Um, that you know, but I ask and nobody's permission. But of course, invited them to the unveiling. Um, they didn't show up, but we brought a bunch of people out, and you know, I think I have a close up of of what Scott's sculpture was. The there ended up to be like quite a bit of pushback, which which was interesting in the end. They the you know the powers that be felt that I had um, kind of crossed some some line. I you know which there's not um, the the I mean the work is confrontational in ways, and I mean I, I think. Some people could read it as irreverent, perhaps. Um, but what I'm, I, but what I'm getting at, and I mean, I, and I think some of it is, it's funny. It's, it, you know, it's like a little absurd in what it's trying and how it's reaching and where it's trying to reach to, and and what that reach ultimately kind of comes back to to me as this individual making that gesture. Um, you know, I think it is, is funny in its absurdity, but my underlying interests tend to be very earnest um, with these. Um, they, one of the speakers was actually had an official position with uh, one of the cultural bodies of Houston. And so that was their, I mean, they couldn't really come at me very much. I invited them, I invited the media, and you know, but they, they because of this person's participation, and that was their in to be like, how could you be there? Like you were misrepresenting the city, we shouldn't have been involved in this, and blah, blah, blah. And so, you know, the attack was at the project, but it came through somebody that they had a connection to. And, and, that person was like, well, I was there speaking and it wasn't on behalf of the city at all. So, um, it, it played out in like a couple of memos that went back and forth and then um, like those got passed to, I think even some people within the city like saw the humor of it and that got passed to a reporter and there was an article that was written and then it was in This, I, it, uh, I don't know, there's a lot of layers. The project is called Public Space. 
Um, it was from 2003 to 2009. And of anything that I've ever done, this project is, um, you know, like was, thankfully it's over, like it was the monkey on my back um, in, in getting it through. It took place in five cities. And in each city, I was kind of overseeing an invitation process to get 24 people from very, very different walks of life to all photograph the same public space. Um, and so, you know, basically what we're doing is we're creating this composite image uh, of like a very, very, like this iconic space at the heart of the city. So it took place in Chicago, Houston, um, Baltimore, San Diego, and then finally in Portland. Um, this is an install view. For, in Chicago, it was Daly Plaza, so right across from City Hall where the big Picasso is. Uh, it was installed in the pedway that kind of connects the L to City Hall, this amazingly sterile space. So all of these individuals, you know, could photograph any aspect of this space that they want. Again, I'm not curating the images that come. Um, like, my interest is in the invitation process, which was also something that I didn't really control, like this daisy chain. I would get, um, like, four or six kind of initial participants, they would photograph the space and then they would recommend another. And then that way it would kind of travel through these different threads to people that I wouldn't have access to. Um, all of this, you know, of course, kind of echoing or mimicking that the, like the notion of, of public or, or questioning, like what is a public? Um, I don't curate images, but they come to me, I'm responsible for producing them and, and then finding and, and then exhibiting them. So we did it in the Pedway in Chicago, which is this amazingly sterile, sterile space um, that thousands of people go through. I, I mean, it was, it was really, really great. It's not usually used for exhibiting art. Um, and like all of that is, is what, keenly of interest to me. But it's playing out like that. In particular, like these are not artists that are taking these photographs. Like some are artists, but some are are uh, you know government officials or mechanics or like any number of different professions, and kind of overseeing their follow through was just really really laborious. And I don't know halfway through the project, I like looking around it people that are doing similar kind of work, like this civic engagement and certain scope, and, and most, if not everybody, is working collaboratively. And, and this project, like I began, there, there was no institutional backing. Um, there was like no other person that was, you know, picking up that, like this bit of slack or that bit of slack. Um, and so, like there was a little bit of a learning uh, curve to just like get it to actually then realize and get all five cities completed. Meanwhile, like the nature of you know, like 2003 to 2009, digital photography and people's relationship, like now you could say, We want 10,000 people to photograph this public space and put it up in Flickr this afternoon, you know, and, and there's a good chance that you could be, get that. Like that said, there was not, like, I'm, I'm very interested about, like somehow 24 or 25 is this weird magic number for me, but like, like what is that, it's not exactly a public, um, but, it's, but it's enough of a cross section to get at some of these other, like the diversity of relationships between images that may make sense together or may not make sense together. All of that becomes part of the project. This was an install view from the, the Baltimore um, uh, iteration, which was presented at this humongous art fair uh, and just on a bridge in Plain Air over a weekend. Uh, so the Cool White Cube, it's like 2006, 2007, like kind of coming back to this interest in um, pedestrian aesthetics. Uh, again, like a kind of a seriality. Um, and also, you know, 
looking like this, like back into this interior. And, it, and of course, I mean, the refrigerator is so recognizable in its, like it's very, very private, but because most everybody adorns their refrigerator, it kind of takes on this public uh, uh, presentation aspect to it. Um, and so just the notion to go in and photograph those and, and what you're looking at is an uh, installation view from the Green Gallery West. Like they're produced as oversized magnets. So they're three by five um, magnets of people's refrigerators. So they have a few details. Um, you know, and of course, like again, there's like who, I'm trying to think if this was the this was, again, like 24. Um, I got 24 refrigerators in the end. Um, but always like looking at what like is the boundary or who is included and why. But even when you can't, because the surface is stainless steel on the front, and you know, like and you can't put magnets there, then course they wrap around and this one I just thought was like an amazingly extreme like the person that would want to confront like their entire year like and where they had been like where they were and where they were going just to get a glass of juice I mean, like, it's hard to imagine that but it is it's a very you know it's practical but it's also like a, a sense of aesthetics um, of course, with the interest in like the individual and you know connecting, like there you have to kind of confront um, technology. This piece, the lone blogger, uh, is from uh, uh, a project that the Indianapolis Museum of Art was doing in 2008 called On Procession, and so they were just like looking at this nature of parade and spectacle, and and. You know, so and, and had a procession for it, where lots of artists of all ill were contributing things, most of which all kind of adhere to kind of some traditional notion of spectacle and bright, loud, like bright and colorful, or you know, kind of um, loud in some way. And my uh, contribution was to kind of underwhelm that process, but to a particular end. In, in that, like the notion of one person with their laptop connected to the internet via an air car, um, and the kind of reach that that has. So, so this was Abdul Hakim Shabazz, a very bombastic radio personality from uh, Indianapolis. You know, being able to comment in real time on anything and get that out to, you know, anyone around the globe. Um, is, I guess, I don't know if you would say spectacle, but I, like it's a different kind of awesomeness. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, I think that, like, so, so the lone blogger was a kind of like a counterpoint within this other kind of uh, parade. Um, back to the brightest stars sun, but briefly, I mean, we, we, we saw the video, like we rolled out the red carpet, everybody is walking across, there's paparazzi um, greeting them, and, you know, again, my, my interest is like I'm working with some local photography groups, um, or even some participants that have kind of crossed the red carpet, there were cameras available, and then they could take on the paparazzi role. Um, you, like all these images get produced, like my main interest in, is experiential and like what that means for people across the red carpet. Uh, and it was it was interesting to be able to do it in two places in Baltimore. The the effect was palpable. I, like there were tons of stuff going on at the Tr Trans Modern Fest, and and but crossing over the red carpet there seemed to like affect everything else that was going on in the space. Um, 
and like the whole the, the people's response and then like the kind of embrace of it like all had this certain energy um, and then when I had the opportunity to do it in Cologne as part of uh, the dark fair it was um, the response was very very different I mean spatially I think it was like the setup was a little bit different and it's very nice this is uh, obviously just kind of giving an indication of like how that threshold is set up. Um, and I think I just have a few, uh, a few details. Um, but there, and I mean, that, that's kind of extreme, but there was not the same kind of like falling into to the, what the piece represented in Baltimore. And there was also not this sense that it, that it then kind of continued into the rest of the event. Um, and, you know, I mean, they, like, it's not that Europe, Europe has its own red carpet, red carpet celebrity culture um, set up. So it was, I don't know, it could have been like the age demographic was different in the below. This is a piece called Come, uh, C-O-M-E, period. The, um, it was installed at the, at the Green Gallery East for its one year anniversary. Um, and I mean, basically I uh, rented a gazillion watt searchlight beacon, like the same thing that any uh, <coughs> club or bar or restaurant, you know, in order to call attention to itself. Um, you know, my interest was to broadcast this invitation to the city for this gallery. And um, Tyson Reeder was having a show in conjunction with the one year anniversary. Um, you know, but to just broadcast that invitation to the city. Um, it just, it was, it was in January and it just so happened that it was a foggy night in January. So there was a lot of moisture in the air, which added to like this very material um, sense of the of the of the piece, which was very nice. Um, and I mean, I guess the other thing in relationship to this is is um, like when I'm working with materials and and what they are like. I'm often like the there'd be one way of kind of getting a searchlight beacon and then messing with what it does to make it, you know, form stars or to make the light do something. And that would be like the artistic um, imprint on the piece. But for me, oftentimes, and certainly in this situation, like it, like the interest is in what this, what, how the searchlight beacon, beacon functions um, normally and kind of using that and shifting the context just slightly. Uh, I mean, it's an, the, the history of the searchlight beacon is kind of amazing. It's developed for military purposes, um, and then, uh, you know, of course, appropriated by like the like crustiest of upper crust uh, Hollywood studios to promote its stars. Um, and then, you know, kind of falls into car dealerships, and now is, you know, bars and, bars and clubs. Uh, and but but still, at that heart is like this this notion that like hey we're here come we want you to know about us and I'm like very fascinated by what what it means to invite um, and I get, I guess it kind of sets up a very certain power dynamic. Just a couple other. Um, this was another piece at Green Gallery East. It was at, so that was 2010 January. This is um, May, I think. And in a, they're almost like part one and part two in a way, though they're titled differently. This is table of contents. Um, I talked about this fascination with list. Essentially, I think it's like 1,700 names that are um, put on the facade. Uh, like the, the glass windows of the gallery. Um, you read the names 
from the outside. Uh, so, like the that's the the privileged position is kind of outside the gallery space. Um, and 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 what else? The the like the only thing that all these names have in common is is me. Um, and so, like there is, I guess, something very egocentric about the the wanting to like display all of these names. Um, the internal logic of why they're there, like it never gets articulated as part of the show, and it doesn't get articulated here. Now they're broken into seven different groups. Um, you know, there is, besides the fact that I put the names on the glass, like there is like some other relationship. Um, but, I, you know, I, I guess it kind of comes back to that, that seriality of the, you know, like these lists have a starting point and an end point, um, but in a way it's arbitrary. And this piece is actually ongoing. It will get presented again, and there will be more names at that point. Um, just a little tighter shot. Um, there were some images on the floor of the gallery, and they were landscapey images. I, I guess the thing of note is that they're um, they're abs absolutely devoid of any social. You know, they they, they feel rather bare. <laughs> Um, and then, at, when the light was just right, the the you know the letters would cast their shadow, which would read correctly on the floor. Like if you were looking at the names from inside the gallery, they'd be backwards, but on the floor they read correctly. Um, wow, well, we've got to we've got to move through some stuff quickly. Um, this is the Native American burial mound in Lake Park. I would love to talk about this for, you know, 50 minutes in and of itself. Um, recently, I've been just like geeking out on landmarks and memorials. Um, I just put it in as a segue. Like, if you know, I'm not going to talk about it at all. Actually, you know, if you want to ask a question about it, we can talk about it. Um, <laughs> I was at a residency in Cleveland, uh, uh, it's this organization, Spaces, and thinking a lot about landmark, you know, I talked before briefly about like public, like this interest in, in public art and like how that kind of maps or locates, gives a sensibility of the city. Um, and, you know, of course that's aesthetic, but also civic. And, and then, it, you know, it, it wasn't, much of a move for me to like shift from that public art to this other kind of civic um, what way of considering or, or systematizing a city, like all the landmarks and what do they mean? What do they mean in relationship to one another? Uh, like what, you know, like there's individual stories, but then there's the stories that kind of aggregate and work back and forth. And um, so that's, uh, for three months in Cleveland, I was just thinking about that and looking at what landmarks were there. Um, if this was like the culmination exhibition and what I ended up doing was really like, doing these drawings, essentially rubbings of the um, Ohio State Historic Marker, like just to outline. Um, and you know, what becomes clear is that like that form is this authoritative form that kind of props up whatever text is on it. Um, at the same time, that form like obscures this whole other backstory of like who paid for it, who actually wrote the text, like like what what you know like oftentimes it makes these references or quotes even, but there's no there, there's no nothing is cited, um, you know so it, like it just validates itself, and this whole other story um, then gets kind of washed over because of the form. And so, I mean, that's, that's part of this interest in highlighting that. So for the installation, there was five of those rubbings, which of course are all the same in the sense that they're all Ohio State historic markers, 
but they're all individual rubbings. Um, I also had the opportunity to make a couple bronze plaques. Um, and the thing that was significant for me was, was in negotiating with spaces was like, yes, we can put them on the facade of the building. Um, <coughs> So they, you know, they would be accessible to the public. Nobody would have to kind of come into the space to see them. But they also agreed that they would be there permanently. So we did this installation, and now, and excuse me, the building is for sale, which made it, you know, quadruply interesting for me to kind of be able to put these plaques there, um, with a question of like, would they ever get removed? Uh, and of course, in my you know unending attempt to kind of locate myself somehow through through some of this work, um, having this opportunity to make a plaque, I made a one plaque to myself, um, and but with purpose. Uh, it it basically what happens is I kind of set up this <coughs> memorial loop. So the top we needed to get some money to pay for the plaque, so we approached the you know like the obvious funders, and they're listed on the top plaque, and they paid for the plaque that honors me, but in recognition of all the other residents for this residency program, many, most of which came from out of the country. It's, um, and so that's what the bottom plaque is, and then I kind of reach into my pocket, and I pay for a plaque to honor the people who played for my plaque. Um, <laughs> I mean, it is just, like if, you know, I don't, I don't know, to explain it seems like, okay, yeah, no, of course. But it gets at, I think, a, like a relationship, I and mean, that's how power works. Like it supports itself in like these very, very, um, I don't know, like very, very efficient ways, you could say, or very, very insidious ways, you could say, and I think both of those things are true. Um, like it's kind of working in tandem and, and uh, the other thing with these plaques is that, again, they like function exactly as plaques um, should function. They look like plaques should look. Um, they're on the street. <coughs> there was, yeah, I mean, I had been thinking about, like, Joseph Kosu did some work with plaques. It, I mean, it makes sense for his text work and this frame that that would provide. But all of that, all of that work that I know of went into the gallery, you know, so then it has this other kind of frame that alters it. And I have this interest in, like, how these function out on the sidewalk. Um, there's, I'm going to skip over it. It's just some instances of plaques that have this kind of in internal self-awareness. I mean, this one is amazing. It's a text by Toni Morrison that's basically saying there's no way that you can embody, materialize, like anything to commemorate the plight of the African American slave. And then the Toni Morrison Society comes along and gives this, a, gives that a material form and has placed a number of these at, at various locations. Um, and this is just, it, I mean, it's like, again, it's just my total geeking out on this, but there's Moses Cleveland found founded the city of Cleveland, and there's this large bronze statue of him, and then this little plaque next to it that basically says, every year you should rededicate this statue. And I think it's, you know, at least 100 years old. And so my question immediately was like, I wonder when they stopped, you know, following the prescription of this plaque, only to find out that they still, they still do it every year, they rededicate it, and so the idea that you could prescribe something into the future, you know, like, like, and, and people would still listen, seemed uh, like an amazing use of the flag. Um, the later 2010, I had a chance to work with Steppenwolf Theater in Chicago. Um, they were doing a play called Detroit, and then this kind of one night um, ancillary event in conjunction, and they invited me to do something, and, and I decided to have a haiku contest to like rebrand or think about Detroit, like use this ancient art form to kind of think about this dying American city. And this was not first place, but it should have been first place. Like first place was then two round trip tickets to go to Detroit. Um, <laughs> 
And this should have been, I mean, it's an amazing, <coughs> it's an amazing haiku. The grandparents live in Farmington, not Detroit. So we never went. Um, and then it speaks volumes about, you know, how people moved out to the, to the suburban rings. Uh, just a couple views of people working on their haikus. And let me, I've worked with like some amazing Chicago poets to actually judge the, the contest. Um, I had talked about uh, that Blue Dress Park, I kind of revisited that uh, 10 years later. For the 10 year anniversary, thinking about power structure and like what embodies is the epitome of power structure, it, like it is the board. And every organization, like when I looked at my yoga shala, which is like a really modest kind of traditional, like not trendy yoga place at all, like my yoga shala has a board, you know, as well as like all, every major corporation. And like I was just curious about what is so um, uh, useful about that structure. And I decided to um, initiate a board for Blue Dress Park. So now the, there's the Friends of Blue Dress Park, which became immediately this collaboration that I don't have any control over. Um, and, and there's, you know, actually people on the board that are uh, very particular about how things get represented. So I can't really say much about the Friends of Blue Dress Park. I initiated this project, and I did it because of this interest in how this power structure works. Um, and now that's underway, and I'm, I'm the creative liaison for the Friends of Blue Dress Park, which is a quasi-board position, like I'm not even on, on the board, actually. This was our setup for our inaugural meeting. Um, we're having our, our, our first year anniversary meeting in November. Um, and this was a poster that we did for an event in May where we covered the space with gingham and had a picnic in Blue Dress Park. Um, and it was a nice poster, and then the board was kind enough to let me um, include that. We're really, we're getting close to the end. Um, uh, while I was in Cleveland, I got to know the Cleveland Urban Design Collaborative, um, which is uh, like a, it's not an art organization, it's an urban planning organization, but they do amazing things. They work with artists. Um, we share this interest in the city and, and like what happens in the city. Um, and you know, I'm telling them about commemoration, and there's this, there's this poet, D.A. Levy, who was a kind of a, or is, a counterculture icon. He died tragically. He took his own life in 1968 after being persecuted uh, by the Cleveland authorities for like totally ridiculous um, um, charges. Things that like if he had chosen to be a New York or LA, like they wouldn't have been harassing him. But the fact that he was in Cleveland, I think made him more vulnerable. And you know, so like two and a half years later, they totally dropped these, these ridiculous charges. Um, and you know, there's a bunch of stuff going on, but he takes his life not long after. And there's, since then, there's been this call for Cleveland to somehow commemorate D.A. Levy, um, which is well warranted. And my idea, so the Cleveland Urban Design Co Collaborative is working on this project called Cleveland Stories, True Until Proven Otherwise. And my idea is to kind of pick up the story of D.A. Levy and connect the, cult the culture wars of the 60s to the culture wars of today, like one battlefront being the fight for urban infrastructure dollars, um, and specifically like bike lanes and you know how we think about getting around the city and you know what we're willing to spend to accommodate that. And so the notion was to to make this bike lane. And well, you know, it's a story. It's a story that this, the, that the DA levy commemoration they've been talking about forever is actually going to take place as this expansive bike lane connecting the east, the west side and the east side, like 17 miles. And it's not, it's not about like a bike trail, uh, that's, it's, it's about like putting down lines on the street and like taking back some of the street for the bicyclists. 
Um, that's the that's the demo. And we had a uh, uh, like a memorial ride last May as one part. The project is actually going to culminate not this weekend but the following weekend with another intervention and ride. I'll be going back out to Cleveland. Um, other way. Um, one other image that I think will make some sense is as I just rip through these last this last series. Um, but this is uh, an <coughs> iconic, amazing piece by the Greek artist, and I'm really not sure about pronunciations, Yanis Kounilis, um, but he's with uh, uh, Art Povera, and he does this piece where he just puts horses in the gallery, and you know, ever since I've seen this documentation, like something about that gesture, um, uh, you know, just made so much sense to me. And I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure why. Or to, and maybe that's not right that it made sense, but I really, really liked it and appreciated it. Um, so as Leah, like, we're gonna have this commemorative ride, and it just so happens it, the Cleveland Institute of Art is at the west end, the east end of, of the Danville. Um, so that's just a shot from the gallery earlier. And the riders show up, of course it's pouring rain, which adds a little bit of drama. And the idea was always, once they get there, that a selected pair of these riders are basically going to bring their bikes into the gallery space and lock the, you know, so it becomes performance at one point that they're entering, and then the bikes are there and it becomes a sculpture. Of course, we made some t-shirts. Um, had a little photo up for the, for the riders. Um, I was thinking a lot about this piece when this invitation to come and do the talk, and so the title of the talk, of course, refers that line is from a, a D.A. Lindy poem called Cleveland Undercovers. Um, that's really, really nice. This kind of like in between meat and psychedelic sensibility, like love hate relationship with the city of Cleveland. Um, I was, you know, and also been thinking a lot about, and this is just my ending note for questions, but like a lot about power and um, the, the Victorian, like this kind of lost flowers. Um, you know, we still know that red roses mean I love you, which is this kind of residue, but once upon a time, every flower had this particular meaning. White chrysanthemums, which play, play a, uh, like a you know, significant role in this piece I did for the Noel exhibition, white chrysanthem chrysanthemums mean truth. Um, and, um, but, like my entry into this interest in flowers was when I learned that the iris um, means, where if one was to give someone an iris back in whatever, 1890, um, in the right context, the message was that I'm sending you a message. <coughs> um, that was the meaning of the iris. The iris is the Greek goddess that was the messenger for the gods. Um, and so, like this notion of kind of removing the content uh, and or and reducing the content is like some step before that this gesture that recognizes like I'm the sender, you're the recipient. This is what we're acknowledging. I guess kind of back again to this this very visceral, this existential exchange. We don't have to worry about like like what the content is. We just have to realize that we're both involved in this exchange. And I mean, that's, it's an analogy uh, that I really, really like. And a good uh, uh, place to end and perhaps take some questions. I appreciate your patience. That was you know, a lot of talking.
curious about your uh, heuristic process. I mean, you have a lot of interests, and, um, a lot of ideas, and you're really flexible. You work in a lot of mediums and materials. Um, how do you choose, like, what ideas you see through to, the, to, to keep showing them to the public, and which, you know, leaving some dormant for a while, and some that maybe, I assume, you never choose to put in a gallery setting. Um, how, how do you go through that process with your own, your own work? It's, uh, it's interesting because I actually had like this little um, segue that I was going to make into and then I had a couple conversations where people were talking, I mean it was kind of between describing or accusing me, it, like there were very art world conversations about the word being opportunistic um, and you know I think that a part of that has to do with how they fit into a very particular context. So like here's this context. Cleveland stories, true until proven otherwise, and then it fits in there. And I don't know, there's something very, <coughs> as I say, those art, those conversations were very art world. And my, like, my response is, I, the work is very opportunistic, but it's, I, like, I see it as a, at a very existential level, like I'm alive, and I have this time and this energy, and so I'm responding to things. And, what things get responded to. Um, I mean, there would, I guess, to be honest, it, they would have to be, a, there's a variety of considerations. Like one might be funding, one might be support, uh, one might just be a totally idiosyncratic, like that, you know, I want this to happen. A public space, I mean, there is nothing opportunistic about a public space. Like I sweated and spent lots of money and lots of time on that project over over six years. Um, and so, like where other things I feel like, oh, that happened because it, other things were falling into place to allow it to happen. So, and, you know, I don't know that I can say other than there's a variety of things. Just to follow up with that question, what like inevitably happened to the work? And then um, I was wondering if you could give us a brief overview of the Native American real ground <laughs> work, if it's possible um, to sum that up at all. Well, and I'm glad that you asked because the that project is one that I had been thinking about, but like going back to Joe's question about how things get decided, there it fit into this other project called Cracks in the Pavement. Um, that was going for a number of years in various cities, but the goal for that was to put work out so that it could be taken. Um, and my project fit into cracks in the pavement, so I was always fine with the notion that this gift is going to be temporary. Um, my emphasis is, you know, was that the ceremony surrounding the unveiling was was official and that gesture was kind of considered an official. Um, and then I guess it becomes uh, it becomes um, convenient or it just becomes somewhat seamless that it then fits in to this other project that I, th I thought was really, really amazing in another <coughs> um, 
the Native American burial mound. It's something that you would, you know, you could easily go by. I mean, it's in Lake, Lake Park. It's the, the, the plaque is from, I think, 1913 or 90, like very, very early. And on the plaque is basically saying, we want to acknowledge this um, Native American, I think they termed it a prehistoric burial mound. Um, the, the, because like at one point there were all of these around the city and all of them, and I think it also says that it's the last, the, the, the only remaining or extant one. Um, certainly it is, when you, once you're aware of it, it is very, very well defined. Um, you know, so, so the notion that they were, all, they were already sensitive to like how this landscape was being altered in 1913, you know, like of course, <coughs> but with my, you know, whatever, 1990, like I, I like, that just came as a little shock to me. That of course they've always been dealing with that. But then the other thing is that they, the way that they approach it is to essentially take a headstone and put their notion of grave, like, like how, what they think is appropriate for this commemoration of death in the form of a headstone, and place it on what was already like, like a much more, uh, uh, I don't know, like, like the mound itself is so amazing that it didn't need a headstone. Like, like the mound was serving that purpose already um, and doing it, um, I'm, trying, I'm not finding the right word. Um, like all, there's just the way the mound feels in the landscape and the, the, I guess the foresight for that culture to be like, no, this is what we want to do for this kind of commemoration. And that, you know, like there it is in the landscape and you can recognize it and it just dwarfs the notion of the headstone that they felt necessary to kind of put on top of it. Um, yes? Um, speaking of uh, Milwaukee being our in Milwaukee, I'm just curious as to, um, like, I want to be an artist in Milwaukee, so like how would you make a living, pay your bills, doing art in the city, sort of, sorry, I can't phrase it right, but, but like if, like how friendly is Milwaukee to arts and? Well, Milwaukee is a great place to get work done. Um, and and I, there's a, a lot of amazing opportunities and a lot of amazing um, energy that's going on here. Uh, so I mean, the first one thing that comes to mind is just like peers and like who you can kind of connect with um, that help feed a certain energy. You know, like that's all about the scene. Um, you know, paying your bills in Milwaukee is going to be easier in Milwaukee than it is going to be in Chicago or New York or LA, and and that's an advantage. And like, there's also disadvantages, different disadvantages that you know attach to not being in one of those centers. Um, the, but your question also just makes me realize that, you know, like the way the economy is, like it's just, uh, it seems like it's gonna be more and more difficult. Um, and that sucks. So, so the, you know, like there, there's a, like a really vibrant do-it-yourself, like how can we fund things, how can we validate things, um, you know, like that's a very, very um, kind of topical discussion, I think, that always goes on in Milwaukee. Um, and, you know, they like there's always new waves of people kind of coming up and thinking about that. So, like, the most practical thing is kind of how to plug into that, find it and plug in. Yes? Uh, I just want to know with regards to, like, just like the blue dress part, um, how you look to bring attention to a space that they overlook and it ends up becoming more of a social movement in, in you know, the aftermath of all of that. And I'm just curious as to when you start your, your work and it turns into something that becomes more of a movement, is that like what your original intent is? Are you happy with that? Or did you just look to bring attention to the space that's being overlooked and that was 
that's a good question in particular to, to Bluegrass Park because as I said, like, it, what I liked is that space the way it was. And like, yes, I brought attention to it, I didn't change it, but I did give it an indication of potential. But then that potential was not acted upon. Like it's exactly the same. I revisited it for a number of different reasons. Like it seemed like the right project kind of attached to this interest in the board and that structure. But now there is like this ongoing discussion with me and the board about what is the appropriate um, next steps for the Friends of Bluegrass Park and how it connects to the original gesture. And I can just say like it's a, it, it's a really, really good experience for me, like part learning curve and part letting go. Um, you know, I set it in motion like I'm behind that and and yet like some of the things that I've set in motion are not exactly easy for me to deal with. Um, so like that, I you know, I, I just find it to be an interesting process of, of questioning like what like what do I really really want? Um, I I want the Friends of Bluegrass Park to move forward as its own entity more than I need to hang on to the original gesture. Examples of, like, besides me reading Tom and Lynn Lore. Well, um, how are they related to you? Um, that is, like, that's not been articulated. I, I guess intentionally. Um, the, and, and the reason that it's not articulated is that it, that it kind of deflects something from this other thing that I'm interested in about the list. Um, like, yes, there is some reasoning that connects these. Um, but then there's also my interest in this list. And, you know, like this, that, that this other, like, oh, now I know what connects them together. I think that, like, lets people, lets an audience be like, well, I don't have to think about that list anymore. Um, perhaps that's a perhaps that's a little overly protective, but um, that's what feels uh, absolutely necessary. <laughs> um, if not, if not satisfied, I can, I just by the look on your face, I can tell that it's not it's not satisfying. <laughs> One last question about the Native American uh, burial ground, and maybe it's because I asked you to sum it up briefly. Maybe it requires, uh, or I, I missed it. What What is the medium of the work? What's oh the Native American burial ground? Right. I, and I'm sorry if that wasn't clear. That that is like a field research photo. I put it in there as like the segue into this interest in landmarks. So that um, was not that was not a piece. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for clearing up. Yes. I just wanted to do a shameless plug. It is used in an essay of Paul Drukey wrote, and that's published on snapmilwaukee.com about uh, memorial sites. So you can check it out there if you want to know more of Paul's thoughts on that, and specifically in Milwaukee landmarks in general. Yes? Um, well, and I, I purposely did not talk about the work in the Noel exhibition because 
like it's there, and I mean, you should go, you should go see it. Um, <laughs> and I, you know, I think it's helpful to have heard me speak, kind of, you know, in approach to the work. If there's a specific question about something in the know, I, I, I mean, I'm happy to answer it. The, but does that make sense? I, like, I think like going to see the work is is more important than my um, talking about. I have. I just wanted to. I mean, I and I try to let you encourage you to go see that show for many, many reasons. Like, there's seven artists. Um, you know, it's the culmination of this fellowship process. There's some great work. Uh, the I have. Um, well, I will say that there are one, two, three, four, I have five pieces there. Um, half of it takes place. It's contextualized by the gallery, and half of it is kind of takes place outside the gallery, or is connected to outside the gallery. And that's very important to me, again, in like the work's relationship to um, the institution and how it's validated. And it puts a lot of, uh, yeah, it puts a certain responsibility on, uh, on our audience to, you know, kind of actively find out what's going on and where it connects. I do that. Okay. Okay. Thank you.